maybe you follow a couple of homeschools, you start getting into the community and you have questions and maybe you don't have the funds to necessarily do it, but I'm sure you can find somebody that's willing to assist, that's willing to point you in the right direction. That's willing to be like, well, you can find a template on here. You might have to change a couple of things, but it'll fit. And I want parents to realize that. That's where like, I went off last night when we were talking about these chancellor meetings. Hello, hello, all those beautiful faces. How we doing, how we doing? Stephanie checking in with another episode of Class Disruption. And today is part two of our discussion with Just a VX Mom, Melissa. Before we get into it, I'm gonna need for you to hit that like button. If you're new here, welcome. We're almost 200 subscribers. and We might be there by now. But if you're new here, I need you to hit that subscribe, hit that bell so you get notified every time I drop a video. And I need you to share this video. That is a, the most important thing that you could do to spread this disruption all around the globe. And like I said, it's part two of our discussion with just the BX mom, Melissa, a blogger and a mom from the Bronx. She has a, an amazing little girl. If you haven't seen part one of our discussion, go check that out because just so much knowledge, so much amazing, uh, just such a big heart, like I said. And, and she's doing such good things for her community, for her daughter. And especially in times like this, we need that parent voice. We need that parent power combined with that teacher power. Like I said, it's class disruption all day with this lady. So without fur any further ado, let's get into this. Maybe I don't have a thousand dollars a month to give a teacher, but mm. if I have to put my kid in partial day or remote learning, I have to pay a babysitter and I'm paying a babysitter $175 to $275 a week. Why don't I think about taking that money out of a babysitter and pair up with some parents and get mm -hmm. my child the education that I want? where I have control over knowing what my child is teaching, or my child's not teaching what the system's telling them to teach and what I want to teach. Now, I'm not there well, yet. Well, you know, know not... I am available from uh, 3 to 5 p.m., you know, maybe 6 p.m. I could do you know? three hours of homeschool a day. And that's the thing. You know, I feel like if parents thought about, else, I think it's thinking outside of the box. It's realizing that, okay, so you work seven to six or whatever your schedule is at, at home. Homeschooling doesn't have to happen during the time that school happens. Homeschooling can happen at night. Homeschooling can happen on the weekends. Home, you just have to hit a certain amount of hours if you want to homeschool. And for those in New York, New York's, I think it's 900 hours or something like it's something. I started, I started looking at what the actual thing is. I think you're about, I think you're about right. It's, I think, and it's based on either elementary, middle, and high school. The, the hours mm -hmm. are a little bit like different. you have to get certain credits, yeah. certain number in each subject. I saw so it's pretty. It is pretty. Uh, like they have a lot of rules and regulations. They, they definitely do, try to. But I think that, and this is from speaking because I've been doing the research for a while. This is from speaking from parents that have homeschooled and parents that are like looking into it. There, there's a lot to look into. But it's also, I feel like it's one of those things where they throw a lot at you because they're hoping it scares you away. Because the reality of it is, education is a business. And this is where I went off mm. my rant. So get ready, because I'm probably going to start ranting. Education is a business for the city. Education is a passion for parents. Education is a need for children. But it's a business. For our government, education is a business. They get paid per student that they have in the school. So when I choose to put a letter of intent to homeschool in, then the Department of Education is no longer going to get that X number of dollars, which is some ridiculous amount of money that my child does not see when she's getting taught out of a book. They lose that money. I don't see that money either as a teacher. I'm like, where's either. my money at? That money gets stuck somewhere between Albany and admin. Like, that's just the reality of it. And it's not a shade because I get it. Admin's cause. I've, I've worked middle management. It costs to be bossy like, but it's not- Gotta it's have not a few assistants so you're important, you know? <laughs> Something gotta happen. You gotta you gotta pay for ink. You gotta pay for ink. <laughs> like that's what it is, right? They 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 check how many colored ink copies teachers made every day. But it's a business, so they don't want parents to put a letter of intent into homeschool their child because then that means that they're gonna get less funding, and then that means the district's gonna get less funding, and that means when it comes when it keeps going up the chain, that less funding keeps coming from someplace. So if I'm intimidated, if I go on the DOE website. And I see that I have to have over 900 hours of studies in. I have to submit my curriculum. I have to 
have like it analyzed or looked at by an educator that's not me. If I have to go through all these steps, I might get intimidated. I might say, I can't do that and work a full-time job. Or I might say, I don't have the education to do that. Or I might just say, I don't know enough to do this. Not realizing that there's so much potential available for what that curriculum looks like. Where I can invest $200 in a lifetime subscription to education.com and get printed materials from pre-K through fifth grade. And full curriculums are available on these sites. You know what I mean? Where I can pull a full lesson plan together. I can use a Khan Academy. I can buy a membership to them. I can get a membership to Brain Pop. I can, and these are just ones, you know, other than education.com that I started using during COVID and lockdown as supplements to what she was getting at school. And to find out, not Khan, because she didn't like Khan Academy. My daughter doesn't like Khan Academy. But Brain Pop is used in her school. So her teachers are playing Brain Pop videos for her in the classroom. If they can get away with that, and the Department of Ed can get paid for a teacher to press play on a computer, why can't I press play on a computer at oh, home? Listen, I pressed that play button good, man. <laughs> you got a certification to press that play button. <laughs> you know? But that's, that's the whole class on that. <laughs> but, you know, I think that what happens is there's a disconnect. We're going to go back to the divides. Parents don't realize the power we have. Parents don't realize what their children are learning in school. So if you're not like, I'm an elementary school parent. Again, I told the, the principal, I'm going to be here. I'm going to know what's happening in my child's school. I'm going to know what's happening in her class. And I always trust what class she's in because since she's been in pre-K, she's been in his daughter's class. And I know that he's not going to have his daughter in a class that doesn't have a good teacher. So I do relax a little bit. I'm like, okay, we're in the right track. As long as you are in class together, then I know you got the good teacher in the school. But listen, I'm, I'm real. I'm a realistic parent. If I see that she got that teacher and you got this teacher, I got to ask another question. Uh-huh. But I pay attention. I know the name of the curriculum that my kids was using. I know the name of the curriculum that we used to use and now we're, we've changed to. I ask her questions. She gives me a detailed summary of what happened throughout the day and when she was in pre-k it was i mean minute by minute like okay mommy left you and you did this what did you do after you hung up your jacket because when i left you were hanging up your jacket and i needed to know who she sat next to in the cafeteria or we call it dining hall who she sat next to in class because she just changes classes because she's in a montessori so in that grade they didn't make them have assigned seating i need to know what you played with what workstation were you at what did your teacher tell you how did your teacher greet you I want to know these things because in my mind, if I get her comfortable saying these things with me in pre-K, when she's in 12th grade and somebody's bullying her or she has questions about sex or she cut school today, she's going to be so used to telling me everything that I'm going to have all the business. I'm going to know all the tea. And does that mean I really want to, did I really care who played with who at recess? And no, I don't, I don't care about the other kids in the class like that. I mean, I love the other kids in her class, but I don't need to know who was bickering with who today if you wasn't involved in it. But I'm going to sit there and that's going to be the most interesting part of my conversation if that's the most interesting part for her. So I've taken that time and we have a really long commute home. We usually take the bus to come home and it takes us an hour and 15 minutes to go from her school to our house. So she gets to tell me about her day for an hour and 15 minutes and I am a captive audience. And I will be that captive audience until she tells me she doesn't want to anymore. And it's happened. You know, there's been days where she's like, I don't really want to tell you everything about it. So I have to get fancy with it. And I have to ask questions. And I have to be like, well, tell me what's the silliest thing that happened today. Or tell me what's the funniest thing. What's the scariest thing? What, what got your teacher the maddest today? You know, I have to figure out how to pull it out because it's going to change. She's growing up and she has her own community. But I'm going to be aware of what happens so that when lockdown happens and I'm on Brain Pop, and I get that she's used Brain Pop, and that's why I learned about Brain Pop, because she taught me about Brain Pop, you know? And I know that they use this in school, and I know that they have them do Go Noodle in school during indoor recess sometimes. So I'm going to put Go Noodle on as I would gym at home. But I'm aware of these things happening, whereas some parents just don't, not that they don't think it's important, but they, again, trust blindly. They trust the educators blindly to educate, not realizing that you give that same education at home. You can put that down as your curriculum when you're going to put a letter of intent in. And the, the deadline, I think, just passed. I think it was the beginning of July for New York City. But that doesn't mean that you can't pull your kid out of school for the year. That means that you missed their deadline, which is like this remote learning August 7th deadline. That means absolutely nothing because you can at any point opt into remote learning full time.
you can't opt out of remote learning full time, but you can opt into it at any point. You can opt into homeschool at any point. What you have to do is within two weeks of making the decision, you have to put in your letter of intent and you have to have your curriculum built or, and it's not, you don't even have to show them your curriculum. You just have to tell them how you plan on breaking down the hours. And I think that's what you submit. So I think, I don't, I, I don't remember exactly when you submit it, but basically like monthly or quarterly, you submit how many hours you did just so that they can make sure that you're on track for the year. So it's intimidating when you look at it, but it's not impossible. And worst case, if you got it, throw some money at it. You can pay somebody to write that for you. There's people that you can pay. If you're worried about messing it up and filling it out wrong, you can pay a homeschooler to write it out and help you figure out a plan. I have a couple that I can suggest to people on my Instagram, you know, that do this. They, I know this is that's what they one. Yeah, homeschool in the hood. That's, I, I love her because she's honest and real about it. You know, and she'll mm -hmm. sit with you and she'll do a free consultation and she'll help you do the paperwork. And you know, and, and a lot of these people do it as a calling. It's not necessarily because they're trying to become rich off of it, but they do it because it's their purpose and their calling. So maybe you follow a couple of homeschools and you start getting into the community and you have questions and maybe you don't have the funds to necessarily do it, but I'm sure you can find somebody that's willing to assist, that's willing to point you in the right direction. That's willing to be like, well, you can find a template on here. You might have to change a couple of things, but it'll fit. And I want parents to realize that. That's where like, I went off last night when we were talking about these chancellor meetings, they're great, but for the involved parents, they're like blowing a lot of smoke because they're not actually answering anything that we haven't already heard. We've, we've done the rabbit hole digs, like we've dug. We're looking at every article that comes out. We're reading every UFT meetings tweets. You know what I mean? Like, and that's another thing. The union is so strong in New York that that's why we don't have a free online school system. A lot of other states, you can take your child out of school and you can use a K through 12, or I just found out that Florida actually has a launch ED or something like that, they call it, which is their online mm -hmm. school system, yep. which is through the Department of Ed, which means like, okay, well, I don't trust myself to do this, but I don't trust the school to do it completely. So I want to do it online or just because it works for us. New York does not allow that. New York says, if you take your kid out of school, you got to pay for a curriculum. If you want to do online schooling with your kid in New York City, you have to pay. And that's because the unions are strong. And the unions know that the more parents pull their kids out of school, the less money comes into the schools and the less power they have in negotiation. And that's really how I see this breaking down. Uh, and, it, and I think because our system is so big and that disconnect between the parents and what's going on in the schools is so wide that the union has just come in and filled that gap and taken over so much and i don't like to say i'm anti-union per se because i do think that groups should be able to come together with like interests and be able to whatever what do they call it? arbitration um yeah you know where they where they work their contracts out together like i yeah. think there is space for that but the the interests of the union have just totally don't align with my values as a teacher like yeah i want to be protected in my workplace but i also like it should be about the students because if i'm not able to like give my students what they need for the best education then my job becomes unfulfilling and it's just about like making a bunch of money or something like which trust me i want i want either. all the money i want all either, the right? money exactly i want it's, all the money but think, it's like you know, <laughs> it's true though like i think it's just like everything like absolute power corrupts absolutely i think that in theory unions are amazing and I, i'm not you know i when i worked when i worked a job that had i've only worked one job that had a union i didn't really understand it because i was Young and that wasn't my interest. I was like, okay, you just pay my dues and you're supposed to protect me. Cool. Do, Got do, you. Like, yeah. I'm not worried about it right now. But I think that there's a purpose in it. But I think that what, just what you said, if it's not about the students, teaching education should not be about the business of it. It should always be about the purpose and the students. And you kind of can't have both aligned. Like, unless you bring a student union, like, let's give the students a union. You know what I mean? Like, let's have somebody at the table talking for them because I feel like they're getting lost in this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's, you know, I, I'm not privy to be at any of the tables, but I feel like what, what it seems like as an outsider is that it's a lot of people that aren't doing the work and aren't affected by the work that are the ones making the decisions. So it's- And, and that's, that's privilege right there. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, it's that's that admin. elitist privilege. It's admins, it's politicians, it's union heads that aren't on the floor anymore. They're not doing the work. They just want they and to be they honest, have- it's teachers too. Teachers, I feel like, are very privileged in this situation because a I mean, at least in New York City, I know there's oh, places where teachers don't get it. You got me in my back. This is my good yeah, side. Yeah, you're back, you're back. This is my good side, okay. <laughs> hey. uh, <laughs> um, is, is teachers, you, you know, like we make pretty decent money. You know, we make, we're pretty good middle class, especially in the city. Like I make good money. You can look up my salary if you want. It's online. Um, and uh, And I get to sit at home and be able to like do my job from the safety of home. But like how many of our kids have that situation? You know what I mean? How many of our kids have parents who, who get to work from home? How many of our kids have parents who didn't continue working this whole time? Like how, and I just think that we're sitting from this very privileged place to be like, no, schools need to be a hundred percent virtual. I don't feel like we're participating in the conversation in like a fair way. Like, of course, I think we need to talk about safety concerns. Like, like you said, we can't trust the DOE. We can't trust the system. But I also think we need to enter the, the, the conversation in good faith. And I haven't necessarily seen as much good faith as I would like to see from teachers. I think that that's a perfect way of putting it. And I think that the good faith isn't coming from anybody right now. I think that, you know, I feel like I might've imagined him saying it because my friend, one of my friends said they don't remember hearing him say it, but even the chance <laughs> that night, I mean, I felt like I was tuning in and out because again, it's like, we've done the work we've put in, we want, we want right. real answers. I don't want the politician answer. I don't, I'm a good BSer. I've worked my whole life in jobs where I've had to BS, whether it was to answer grants or it was to calm down and appease an angry client. Like I know how to make stuff sound when I, I got don't that. Have to. I got that social ju- justice oriented, culturally responsive, <laughs> exactly. uh, like, Black Lives Matter, all that in this. I can throw all the hashtags and trending and make it seem like I'm telling you what you want without telling you anything. And I feel like that's a lot of what happens when they come on these meetings. Yeah, it's like, the same thing with the Bronx they Borough the, meeting. They pick the answers they want to, they pick the questions they want to answer. They speak from the space where they're saying a lot of nothing. And I get a lot of it is because there aren't real answers out there right now because everything's so up in the air. But I'm a straight shooter. I want to hear that. I want to hear, listen, we don't got a lot of new information from last time we were here. We're working on it. This is the reason we don't have it. This is what we're hoping to get to. But he basically said that he wouldn't be sending his kids to these schools if it was over. You know, there was, I forgot what the line was, but somebody said something and he was like, because he started talking about everybody wearing all these different hats and how anybody with a, with a teacher certificate is gonna have to just basically get in where they fit in. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, get in where they fit in and it means that you know, he's like myself included, literacy coaches, this person, that person, they might have to lead a classroom. And, you know, I can't necessarily say that if, if I was a parent, I would be sending my child back to the school right now. I'd be doing remote. And it's like, okay, so you might not have meant to say that. And I might have imagined hearing it. I'm, I'm no sad. I didn't. I haven't gone back to the transcript to check it out. But when you have somebody, just because somebody has a teacher certificate doesn't mean that they're prepared to teach anywhere especially if they've been doing a certain type of subject or class for the time that they've been in their career. You know, I know a school where the dance teacher is now being thrown into fifth grade because they don't need a special teacher right now. They need a fifth grade teacher. Now, I get that you're supposed to be flexible and be able to go anywhere if you have a K through six or whatever the licensing is. But the reality of that, that's like saying, if you drive a car, you can drive a bus. Like... It doesn't necessarily work. Or if you drive, you know, you've driven a hybrid your whole time driving. Since you were 16, you've driven a hybrid, but tomorrow you have to drive a Tahoe. It's not the same thing. You know, it, it takes a different type of learning. It takes a different type of person. And we need to be realistic about what that means. And that goes back to the power of the parents. If I don't know that Miss Stephanie has been the dance teacher for the last eight years and has only taught dance and maybe filled in for some health class. I don't necess- I need to know more about how you're going to teach history this time. I'm going to need to know what you know about algebra before I sit down and tell my child to trust. We're doing that interpretive said. dance to my recordings of a podcast telling about history. For real. 
Like my godson is in a district 75 school and is going to school over the summer. Cause he goes to school every summer. He chose, like his mother gave him the option this year. He's, he's in middle school. So she gave him the option on if he wants to go to school for the summer or not, he chose to. So he has this art teacher and my friend has not been into this art teacher since the whole lockdown. She doesn't like how he does his stuff, but she said it's art. I don't really care. She's, you know, I'm not, it's, he needs, to, I'm worried about my child's reading and math and science right now. This summer, he's the ELA teacher. She is having a fit because he has these, and I get that middle school students, but they're district 75 middle school students that are in actuality learning third grade work right now because we've compared what she, what he's doing to what Misa's is doing and things like that. So she knows where he is at developmentally with his work capabilities and his comprehension skills. This ELA teacher that is really an art teacher is assigning TED talks to the students. He's finding all these things that aren't necessarily where they're at. And I'm all about raising standards and raising expectations to get a child to raise their comprehension and things like that. But you have to know your audience. So if you have an art teacher that is playing over here, but you have kids that need to be here, you need to be able to meet them. You need to be able to teach them how to get from here to here. You don't just throw them in the deep end if they, they just learn how to blow a bubble, you know? And I think that that is what, like, it's happening right there, but it's what's going to happen on a much larger scale when we get into September and you have teachers that are being thrown into the deep end and only know how to doggy paddle. You know, they're going to have to, they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose their security, then some of them are tenured and they're gonna be like, I don't care. They're gonna say, this is not in my contract because the union's fighting strong and saying, you don't have to do that because it's not in your contract. And parents aren't gonna know these things because a parent might not be home when the child's learning. A parent might have had to leave the child at a babysitter. A parent might have had to leave the child with a family friend. You know, what you talked about there, that divide I think is huge. A lot of children don't have a learning corner. I had to create this space. I knew my child was going to be doing remote learning. I created a space. She's had a desk. She's had a desk for the last two years. You know, I know. So that, I want that desk. I want the desk too. I had this little crappy <laughs> desk. And every time I'm like, I'm like, do you really need that desk? Do you want to trade with me? She has a really nice desk, which is only $100, like $120 on Amazon. I look for, I look for my deals. But, you know, it's again, like, this is why I say we have privilege where these are things that have always mattered to me. So they've had, I've always wanted her to have a learning space, but we live in a one bedroom apartment. It's two adults, me and her grandfather and her. That's what I'm saying. I don't even say, see how you say we're privileged. Like that is not like you make it happen. You know what I mean? I like you, I, I mean, like I'm, my place not big, but me and my son each have our own room. You know what I mean? Like, and so and it's like, privilege. dang. You know, and it's, but I say it, and I always come back to saying it because I don't want people to think that I think that everybody can do it. I don't think that everybody can take a quarter of their quarter size living space and turn it into a space for their child. I don't think everybody has the, has the desire to do that. But for me, it's a value. For me, it's a priority. I need my child to have a space where she feels safe. I need my child to have a space that when she's on, and again, I don't know what full day is going to look like. She used to have, for spring semester, she had a half hour live instruction time, which meant that for only 30 minutes a day, I had to make sure that our one bedroom apartment was quiet enough that she had a space to learn it by herself. So we hopped around. We tried a nook under our TV thing in the room that she wanted to create, and I loved her little nook that she came up with. We used that for a while. We used her toy corner for a while which is where i was gonna i have was gonna say i remember that one i remember seeing yeah. the picture all the animals that was so cute yeah. i was gonna i was gonna your, room, your, your house looks big all these different spaces <laughs> it's all about the angles it's all about the angles. <laughs> i create space because we don't she doesn't have her own dedicated space i don't ever want her to not feel like she has space so i'm right. willing to sacrifice i'm willing not to you know have a space to line up what I when I, well, I used to have a whole bunch of shoes and all this, like I can go without 
but I don't want her to go without. And see, so, that's what I think it is right there. That's where it is. I think, and, and sometimes we get confused with it, right? Because it's all about that instantaneous gratification, but also that status gratification, right? Mm -hmm. So whereas some people think that, okay, I'm going to make this short-term sacrifice of like buying this expensive thing so that my kid looks like they have status, right? So we're, whereas you're making the same sacrifice like in monetary value, mm -hmm. but you're choosing to invest it into something where you don't get like that satisfaction until it's a little bit more long term. Mm -hmm. And and I definitely understand like like you just have lower like if if you're working harder, you're more stressed out, like you have lower like capacity like in your mind to be able to like weigh these options on a logical level. So maybe like you could say that's where privilege comes in. Um, but I also just think maybe like a little bit more awareness of how those things function. And I think about, you know, I think it's that whole idea of like, we're always supposed to want better for our kids, right? We're always going to want to do more. And for me, I think my parents did the best that they could. I will never say my parents, oh, what was me? My parents did this. That, I don't, I don't live on a crush. I think that they made some really bad, poor choices. Over time, I think that they could have made better decisions on stuff and when it came to the things with me and things with themselves, but I think that they did the best with what they had and what they knew. I think that they gave me the best gifts that my parents ever gave me is that I've never doubted them loving me. And I think that a lot of our kids doubt being loved. You know, they don't, they don't know what it is to, to know that their parent loves them regardless. And I've never doubted that with my parents. And I mean, I've gone through stuff with my parents, but I've never doubted their love for me. And... My dad, my dad got locked up when I was about 10 years old. And I remember being really embarrassed about it then. You know, I was 10 years old, everybody knew my dad, and then all of a sudden he was in jail. And I was really embarrassed about it. And I remember sitting with him on a visit one day and him saying, listen, kid, I'm myself. You're yourself. I love you. I'm always gonna have your back. I'm always gonna be there for you, but you have to live your own life. You are responsible for your consequences. You're not responsible for my consequences. You're not responsible for your mother's consequences. What we do is what we do. Our choices are our choices and your choices are your choices. And I mean, I might not have heard it the right way that day, but that's always stayed with me. So every choice I make, I have to own it. Whether it's a good choice or a bad choice, I have to own it. And I have to do my best to make the decisions that are going to put me in the best place going forward. So... For me, it's real easy at this point. And I had my daughter when I was in my 30s already. You know, if I would have had her 10 years earlier or even five years earlier, you might be talking to a different person right now. But I lived a full life. I danced on tables in Greece. I went, stayed out of my house for seven days in a row and bought new underwear outside because I didn't have time to go home and change. You know, I lived a really fun and fabulous life in my 20s. And I don't regret any poor decision I made. And I made a bunch of them. But I don't regret any of them because I was able to make them at the time. And there was, no, there was nobody that had to deal with my poor choices. But now, I'm 41 years old. If I make a poor choice, my what? child has to deal with that. I just got good genes. But, you know, my child <laughs> has to deal with my poor choices. If I choose something that doesn't serve us and serve our purpose then she's left having to deal with the repercussions of that because she's only seven. So when she's older, she won't, you know, she's not responsible for me and I'm not responsible for her. But at this moment, I have to make the best choice for our life because we're a unit. I'm all she got. So when it comes to her education, you gotta take it. When nah, it comes nah, to her education, I need to make the best choices because I wanna prepare her for the best life. I want to prepare her where, you know, she can have her kid have their own house at seven if she wants. She doesn't have to worry about them having a corner or a room. You know, I want her to have that kind of setup. And she's going to be set up for that because her bank account looks better than a lot of adults I know today. You know, because I told her, there's not a lot that mommy can do for you, but I can prepare you. I can give you a place to start. And that's what it's about. It's about giving these kids a foundation that they can start. So for me, that priority has always been through education. I don't want her to ever not feel like she can sit down at a table. I've been blessed and being put in positions where I've, you know, I talk about cold switching at the beginning and I told her about sitting at tables and I've sat at a lot of different tables and I've realized what it means to be able to cold switch and be able to speak to you today and this person tomorrow. 
and not make anybody feel uncomfortable or feel like I don't belong. And I don't want her ever to not feel like she belongs. She is a Puerto Rican or Reuben child that's coming from the Bronx, goes to school in the poorest congressional district in the country, and is coming from a single parent household. When people look at her, they're gonna expect her not to sit at that table. But I want her to feel like she owns that table. And the only way for me I was to gonna do say, nah, they already gonna know because she brought her own damn table and laid out her own product and she's doing the math in the back. Like they already gonna know what it is. They're gonna be pulling up to her table. Exactly. And for me, that's what it's about. It's about preparing her. And you know, and that's why I say, you know, you can't take somebody's education away from them. But but you can allow them not to be educated. And we come, if we leave it up to the Department of Education, especially in this moment, when all they're trying to do is figure out how to open and get funded. Like, that's the reality of it. Everything is a dollar game. This whole country is run on a dollar game. And I'm not going to let my kid just be another line in the budget. You know, I'm going to let it. And this is, this is the reality. This is me being as transparent as I can. The only reason I haven't put in a letter of intent is because I don't ha- want to have to worry about meeting those $900 right now because I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I don't know if I'm going to, you know, decide I'm not, I'm going to go back and find a new job. I don't know if I'm going to open a new business. I don't know if, I don't know what it's going to bring. So I don't want to be responsible for those $900 today. Tomorrow that might change. I might get what our school is going to look at as their remote learning and say, this ain't going to work for us. And I've already had that conversation with her. I started having this conversation with her in May. And that's the other part of it. Our children deserve a voice in this. It's real easy for me to say, I don't want her in a school building. It's real easy for me to say, I want her back in a school building. But she matters in this because this goes back to, it's her life. She has to be responsible for it. I don't know, when I leave her at that school, I hope that she's gonna tell me what happens today. And I trust her to tell me what happens because of the relationship that I've built with my child. But she has her own life when I walk out of that school. She has that own life of her friends and her teachers and the paras in her school that she knows, even though she's never had a para in her life. Like she, my kid is like the mayor of her school, you know, and, and the blessing thing is her school only has 300, and I think 329 kids last, last semester they had. And their community where all of the staff knows the majority of the kids, but every person knows my child. If they don't know her by her name, they know her by her hair. They know her by, she, she was the one that presented on Ruby Bridges, for community day, they know her, they value her. She has a community in her school. So I, it wouldn't have been fair to me to make that decision without including her in it. Right. And a lot of people look at that and they're like, but she's seven, she doesn't have a say. The hell she does, she's a human being. She's had right. a say since she's And it's also how you life. set it up. It's also how you set it up. It's like, you know, like obviously as the parent, you're gonna get final call. But even if they aren't making like the decision, they should be at least involved in the, the process. So if it doesn't necessarily go totally their way, at least they feel like they have agency. At least they exactly. feel like they were part of that discussion, right? It's about setting up those boundaries and saying, okay, yeah. here's and our choices within this boundaries. And exactly. learn how to advocate for themselves. I'm real quick on like I was really shy as a kid, so I wasn't comfortable talking out loud a lot, which was no. really funny. <laughs> I know, like what? who would thought it? I mean, I, I was one of those kids that used to say, she's really smart in school, but she talks too much, so I still always talk to my friends, but I was shy. And I didn't want that for my child. So I forced her to advocate for herself. Yeah, I can get up and tell somebody that she needs a pencil. I can get up and say, Oh, this happened and she needs help with this. But she has to want to take that initiative. She has to be the person that you want that? Okay, go ask for it. I'm here, I got your back, I'm always gonna support you, but you need to learn how to speak for yourself. And that's something that I'm big on. So if I'm telling her that that's how I want her to be in the world, how do I not let her be that in our house? Mm. This is a place that she's supposed to have trust. We're a team. If we're partners and I'm telling her we're partners and I need her to help me clean the house because it's our house and we're partners, how do I get to make a decision on her life without including her in it? Mm. And I'm. I tell all the time, I'm way too straightforward with you. I don't sugarcoat stuff for you. I read her exactly. This is what a school day is going to look like at your school. And this is how I think you're going to react to it. You tell me if you think different. And she'll be like, nah, that's not going to work for me. I'm not going to like that. You're right. And even things that I thought she'd be okay with. She's like, no, I'm not going to be okay with them taking my temperature every day. No, I'm not going to be okay with not being able to hug my friend. I haven't seen my best friend since school closed. I want to hug my best friend. You know, so those are the things that for me, it's not, at this point, 
I trust her. I trained her how not to touch things when we go outside. You know, she wears these really cute little satin gloves as her little barrier between her I saw and the that. Girl. Yeah. She, you know, she knows how to keep her mask on. She's really good at this. She understands. I've taught her the gravity. My father has COPD. His lungs work at 23 to 26% on a good day. He survived catching coronavirus. My mother is mm. homebound. She has asthma, she has diabetes, and a whole other heap of problems. I am the primary caregiver for both of my parents. So I can't risk bringing them an illness into our house. So I have taught my seven-year-old what that means and how we protect not only ourselves, but those that we love. And that right. includes other people in our community. So I'm not worried about her going and being careless and taking her mask off and dropping her mask on the floor or licking a doorknob or something. That's not her reality. <laughs> That's not who she is. You know, there's kids that do that. And I feel sorry for the teachers. I have to stop those kids from licking them doorknobs. But that's not who she is. For me, it's about her mental health. My child's an empath. She picks up people's energy. She picks up people's feelings. There's times where I think I'm doing okay, and then I realize that I'm feeling bad, and I'm wondering why she's been in the funk all day, and that's why. Or my phone will ring, and she'll have just been acting a fool. And I'm like, who are you? Because you're not my child right now. And I'll answer. <laughs> and it's somebody from our village having a breakdown of their own. And I'm like, now that explains it. You know, so she picks these things up. She's a loving kid. She's, she needs to be on. She needs to be involved. So to put her in a position which sounds a lot like solitary confinement, I can't do that to her. I can't go from a school where everything's about the collective to ask her to sit at a table six feet apart from her best friend and not hold hands or share their pencil or it's just, it's not going to work for her mental state. So for me, that is even more important. That's something that I would have to figure out how to sacrifice. If I had a job where I had to go to every day, I'd still have to figure out how to sacrifice because that for me is a priority. I, for me, I, like I said, you know, I've done all this other stuff in my life. So for me, it's not about how much money I make. It's about the value and what I have in life. So I'm willing to take a little bit less to know that I'm getting more somewhere else. And for a lot of people, that's hard, especially when you grow up in areas and again i'm coming from the i space i grew up being poor so i get it i want to jump at money i want you want to give me the opportunity to make how much you want i can do that i can do that and that's who i was before becoming a mother i'm gonna bank as much as i can because i know that tomorrow can all go away but for me i have her for such a short amount of time that i'd rather sacrifice and find ways to be with her and i don't think that'll work for everybody you know what i mean everybody doesn't can't prioritize the way I do. But I want parents to know that they have that power. So if you can't do it, then hook up with people that can. You know, find your community. It doesn't have to, you don't have to know it. You don't have to know how to teach. You don't have to, you don't have to have Wi-Fi. You know, the library is gonna open back up and you can do online time there. Or you can go to the library and pick up books because they're grab and go right now. I haven't looked at the list, but I know for the Bronx, when the library first opened up, it was the Belmont Library near Fordham Road. That was the first library to open up. For oh, that's right by my school. Yeah, grab and go and order some books online, and that's your curriculum. You can you can read one book and create a whole curriculum around it. You can get a book on, you get a Magic Treehouse book, and you can handle ELA. You can handle history. You can handle science. You can handle you can handle math. You can you can make it all up from the one book. You don't have time to go to the library? Okay, you got a phone? Epic Books gives parents two hours. For the summertime, they're giving you two hours free reading. That's not a lot of time to read. But you know what? You break that up. Let your kid read 20 minutes a day. Let a kid, like, you, you figure out what works for you. And that's what it's about. Don't be scared. We need to take our power back and lose the fear that we don't know what's best for our kids. And what's best for my child isn't going to be what's best for your child. What's best for your child isn't going to be what's best for the next child. But it goes back to the beginning. If we are, we are our children's perfect parents, they were delivered to us for a reason. Our children, whether you believe that your child picked you, which I do, I think, you know, she, she sat on a shelf and her and the higher beings decided that I was her mom. And she, I can't imagine having any other child. So she was either waiting for me or she picked me. But however you think you and your child got paired up, you're a pair for a purpose. And you can't be afraid of figuring that purpose out. You might not know what that purpose is. You might not have found that soft spot yet. Whether your child's 18 or eight days, you, you have time to find that spot.
but you have to trust yourself in finding that spot. You have to trust that it doesn't matter what big words the chancellor, the teacher, the principal, the doctor uses. You know what's best for your child. In the same way you know when a doctor's not telling you right for your child, you need to know when a teacher's not telling you right for your child or when a school's not telling you right for your child. You can't be afraid of schools. You can't be afraid of your child's education. I remember a few years ago, this was like way before I had my daughter. I had a friend whose daughter started kindergarten. And I remember saying, oh, what was her class? Like, like I was really excited because she was like one of the first ones of our friends to have a daughter in school. And I was like, what was, what was it like? What was her teacher like? What was her class like? Where did she sit? Like I wanted, I wanted to see it in my head. I wanted to visualize it. And my friend was like, they didn't let us into the building. I don't know. She'll tell me about it when she comes home. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> And she was like, yeah, we're not allowed into the building. Like, that's not, that's not what they do. Protocol is you drop them off with their teacher in the morning and you pick them up from their teacher in the afternoon. And I'm like, no. It's just, <laughs> like, that's not like, my protocol. <laughs> like, there's no way I'm handing my child to a tr- stranger that tells me she's the teacher. What if, this is a, what if this is a crazy person that just came into the schoolyard? Like, no, it doesn't work for me. I am like, I am that person that will go from... a a skin knee to like having an amputation leg off in my head. Like I will jump to the worst case in the world. But I, when she told me, and this had to be at least close to 10 years before my daughter was born. And at that moment I knew when my child went to school, that was not going to be the kind of school she went to. And this was without knowing who my child was or when I was having a child. I just knew that there was no way that my soul could sit with me not seeing the classroom and inspecting the classroom mm. and making sure the chair wasn't rocky and all that other crazy stuff that I'm going to do on day one. And this isn't because I thought my friend was a bad mother. My friend was, is one of my role models as a mother. You know what I mean? Like this is one of the, these women that I still to this day, when I'm needing help, I go to as a guru. So it's not that I thought she didn't value her daughter, did it, but for her, it wasn't, it was fine. It sit with her soul. She was comfortable with this. And that was okay because it worked for her. It worked for her family. But I knew that that wasn't going to be what worked for my family. And when I looked for schools, that was one of the questions I asked at every orientation. What happens on the first day of school? How do I, you know, can I come into the school? Do I get to see her classroom? Do I get to see her in action? And my daughter went to one preschool for seven days before she transferred to the school she's in now, in pre-K. And I used to be able to sit and have breakfast in her class at that first school. And for me, it was the transition I needed. You know, so, and it also gave me the strength to be able to ask those questions again when I went to the next mm. school. And I wanted her school. Listen, I waitlisted for her school. I jumped through hoops to get her into the school that she's in. I wanted her in the school. I knew I wanted her in the school when she was three years old. I knew, because I was looking for schools that time, because for me, it was important. I needed to know that I wasn't going to be stuck dropping my kid off at a door and not knowing where that door took her. I needed to know that my child was not going to, my neighborhood school, the elementary school has, when, when I haven't checked it in a while, last time I checked it had 1,294 kids in it, a pre-K through fifth grade school. I couldn't have my daughter in that school. It, I couldn't imagine my little girl walking through a hall for the first time and having over 1,200 other kids walking in this hall with her. And I get it, they all wouldn't have been at the same time, they all wouldn't have been in the same space, but it didn't sit right in my soul. So I started doing research even before, I was like, if I need to volunteer at a school the year before just as a volunteer in the community, then I'm gonna do that to get her into the school I want. And I didn't have to do that, but we got waitlisted and I went through all this to make sure that she was in a school where I felt comfortable. You know, so this is where that accountability comes in where you can't just expect a school to be right. You can't just expect a school to give your child their best and to want their best for, their, for your child because they have to serve a full population. At my daughter's school, they can't just do what's right for her. They have to do what's right for her plus the 328 other kids in that school. You know, and as parents, a lot of times we only care about our child, which makes sense because they're your child, they're your world, but we have to care about those other kids. We have to advocate for those other kids just as hard as we do ours. And we have to remind those parents that they have power. And that was my rant last night was if we all decided on Monday to put a letter of intent into our schools that we were homeschooling, the schools would close down. They would be bowing at our feet asking us to bring our kids back. Because that's it. My school has 329 kids in it. 
If I spoke to every one of those parents and said, this school's not serving our child, and I will help you homeschool your child if you put in a letter of intent, our school is closing down. And that same power lies with parents in every school out of, I think there's, when I did, I, I Googled and it was somewhere around 17 or 1800. Yeah, 1800, in- something like that. Yeah, like maybe like 1836 or something like that. Because I put the wrong number. I put in my post 1700 because that was the first number I found. And then I kept looking into it. I think it's like 1836 or something like that. But we have that same power in all, in every school in New York City. Parents have that power and we don't know that. And we don't believe that and we don't see it. Because what we see is bureaucrats getting on and having conferences and telling us what we're supposed to do and how they're going to have it happen and what they expect us to do. No. That's not what it's about. And if we keep giving our power away like that, then we can't complain about it. We can't complain when our kids are regressing because all they're doing is watching a YouTube video. But it's also then we need to know that all they're doing is watching YouTube video when they're in class. And listen, I'm all about YouTube. My kid learns so much off of YouTube. I didn't want to teach her how to teach how to tr- how to tie her sneakers because I didn't think I had the patience for it. I told her to go to YouTube. She learned from somebody in her school, one of the women that works in her school told her. But I said, go to YouTube. You'll figure out how to tie your shoelaces because I done told you and you don't want to listen to me. <laughs> so I'm all about YouTube. Coyote Peterson is her science teacher right now. You know what I mean? Like I'm all about there's there's value there, but I'm not sending my child to the Department of Education to press play every day. I'm okay with it being an added bonus because children learn differently. And I think some kids will learn off of YouTube more than they'll learn off of writing on the board. But that shouldn't be the whole lesson. That should be how you build the lesson. That should be how we start or end the lesson. You know, it shouldn't be the full thing. And if they're already doing that in school and I don't know it, I deserve to know it. And for me, that's what it is. It's about accountability both ways. It's about accountability from the Department of Education. And it's about accountability from parents. And it's about parents not being passive. I get it, there's passive parents, I get it. there's parents that say, listen, this isn't my wheelhouse. This isn't what I love, this isn't my purpose in life. I'm gonna, I just want my kids to be smart enough to be able to get into college or be able to get a job when they get out of school. That's all I want. They don't need to know about the young lords. They don't need to know about Columbus not just never setting foot on the United States. They don't need to know those things. I don't care. I just want them to go to school. I just went to school and that's fine. And that's okay if that's the kind of parent if that works for your home, that works for your home. Your kid will work for my kid later, but that's that's another story. But <laughs> this is not the time to be passive. This is a time where you got to show up and show out. Because if we don't show up and show out now, then the divide is going to keep increasing. Mm-hmm. You know, the digital divide is real. It was an adjustment for my daughter to get on and start remote learning and having to fill out Google Forms and figure out how to log into Google Classrooms and type and all this stuff. And she's been been part of this world. You know what I mean? She's always been part of technology. She's always gotten a chance to jump on my laptop or jump on my desktop and play with the mouse a little bit and play a computer game. But it was a challenge for her to actually have to sit there and do work on the computer. Where she was like, I don't really like typing anymore. I liked typing before this, but now I don't like it because I have to do it. You know, whereas there's other kids that have never had the chance to feel a keyboard. I think that DOE failed kids by sending them iPads. I think that they should have purchased and supplied laptops for every child because laptops cost the same amount as iPads do. I was going to say how much, you know, like a get, to get a, a Chromebook, they're yeah. not expensive it's, and they're good. They're not. And it would have given our children the chance to catch up with other kids. It would have given, it would have lessened the digital divide because now they would have gotten a skill. Typing is a full skill. I'm old enough that we didn't take, I didn't take typing, I took typing on a typewriter in high school. You know what I mean? Like computer class was something special and those computers were huge and they didn't have enough for the whole class and you had to share and you didn't see them all the time. We didn't have one in our classrooms. Like it's a skill and our kids need the skill because their life is, they're in a different place. They're a YouTube generation. I get it. Mm. They're about you know, every kid needs to have a ring light and a camera at home at this point. But they're not getting that. And I feel like we missed the opportunity on this. Every school should be supplying every student. And this is one of those places where parents need to call schools out. Why does every school not have a classroom worth of laptops for each student? 
Because all it should have been doing was when we picked up their packets or they went in to pick up their textbooks in the high schools, part of that pro package should have been their laptop that they use in school. Because every student should be using a laptop in school. Because if they're not, then they're already being set up for failure. Because that means what, they're supposed to go to college and then learn how to use a computer? They're supposed to go to college and then learn how to type? That's not fair. You're setting them up five years behind, 10 years behind from these kids. When you See, have kids I blame the AOL field, Instant Messenger, right? <laughs> it's, because, it's because they don't have the pleasure of having AIM. You know, they, they're on their cell phone using their thumbs. Me, we, we, had, we were relegated to our laptops. Yeah. AIM, Instant Messenger had. That's, that was my type of lessons right I there. I live in the computer lab. Listen, college, I live <laughs> in the computer lab because I didn't want to sign off for AIM. You know, I might, I might miss something. <laughs> <laughs> you got to put up your away message. <laughs> you might miss the message. We learn how to we don't learn how to how to code from Black Planet and Mi Gente. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, MySpace you used to have to do coding to get yes. your your color your background changed. <laughs> these are the things where it's this generation. This was fun for our generation. You know what I mean? Like because we were the first ones to like figure this stuff out. But they need this stuff. They need to know. How, it, it, was, it was fun for us. It was a joke for us, which is why none of us remember coding now, you know, 15 years, 20 years later. But they need this stuff because they can't go out into the workforce without this. You go to McDonald's now and you got to use the damn touch screen. So it's not like there's nowhere in life that they're not going to use a device. So why are we setting them up for failure to start? You know, there shouldn't be a school that doesn't have a device for each child. That device I don't care how easy a tablet is to use and how cheap they are. If you're sending iPads home, you can buy a Chromebook with that same money. And that's what each child should, have been, should be receiving. Whether or not I say I have a device at home, she should have one at school that's being sent to me so that she can use her device from school. And then she has hers as a backup if something happens. Or she has the school one as a backup if something happens. But the only way for us to close this digital divide that everybody wants to throw around as a new hot topic. So once the world opens up, that's gonna be the new grant writing word. You're gonna have a whole two years of that's gonna be the trending thing. That's gonna be the Oh good, I just started a nonprofit. I need to yes. I need to write that write one it down. down. Digital divide. When I was in when I was in when I was a nonprofit, we would have to change our grants just based on what the keywords were. So one year it would be gang awareness, the gang prevention, the next year's team prevention. We'd be doing the same service, putting a different word on it because that's what gets the money. Digital divide is definitely going to get the money because that's what everybody wants to talk about right now. But they want to talk about it, but they don't want to fix it. They don't want to mm. say, what do we need to fix mm. it? How do, we, how do we make it balanced? How do we not make it a divide anymore? How do we connect it? And we are in the perfect place to connect it. You know, this is, I, I know you talk about this too a lot, is give you the freedom to create your own curriculum. Give you the freedom so that you can teach your children the way you want to teach them. We threw tests out this year. Why are we bringing them back next year? Why am I seeing talks about, oh, we need to talk about what standardized testing is going to look like? We know standardized testing doesn't work. We know standardized testing is, is income and race bias. We know that already. So why are we still putting it as the, the tell-all and be-all of how to tell if a child's smart or not? Right. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think like at the high school level, like those subject based tests, especially those should be the first to go. I would I mean, I think that we should have some sort of objective measure of like reading and math and like we can go back and forth on like, you know, the bias um, language and try to make them, you know, as inclusive and pos as possible. But for sure, like, I, I don't think that they're going to do state testing this year, though. I hope not, you know, but I see that they're already talking about should they be doing it, how they're doing it. And I agree. I mean, I'm not, so I'm not anti-test. I think that they serve a purpose and everything like that. I think that at some point you need to learn how to take a standardized test because you got to go get your driver's license, which I still don't have, but I take my permit a hundred times. Like you, you need to learn how to fill in the bubble at some point. So right. I think that there's, you know, there's but a overemphasize for sure. But, but when you look at them and you put the amount of pressure on these kids, when the mm. test has nothing to do with them, when it's right. about looking at funding again, we're going back to the F word, funding, then there's a problem with it. You know, when it's... when It's, it's no funding without fun! <laughs> Except the kids don't get to have fun because we're so worried about the funding. You know, like, when it comes to high schools, like, I remember Regents tests and, and studying for, like, I, I was horrible in math. Like, I mean, I could barely add one plus one in high school. What, I don't you can't know. divide polynomials? Like... 
I mean, it was like, I would, I, I still can get in sweats. I remember one time I was so scared because I was like, I'm not going to, like, I was taking all honest classes. I was taking AP classes and I was taking like dummy math. I was still in like sequential math. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would push it back. I'd always arrange my schedule where I wouldn't have to really deal with it, right? And I did the same thing in college. I almost didn't graduate college because I almost didn't pass math. Yo, but like, business math is dumb easy. I took a business math class in college and I was like, dang, why was I even taking calculus in high school? I like, took a what? fundamentals of math class in college because it was supposed to be the easy way out. Like all the jocks took it, but I waited until like the end. And then for whatever reason, the teacher had it out for me. And like, I would like paraphrase what he said. In the, like it would be like written exams because it wasn't like any kind of equation. It was all about like the theory of math. And I was like, I can handle this. I'm a writer. I can do this. And then I'd be like failing. I almost failed it. And I went to like, I went crying to my deans. Because I was on RA, I was an RA, and I was on scholarship and all this stuff. And I was like, if I fail this class, I'm not going to be able to graduate, and I'm going to have to come back for a semester. My scholarship's going to be over, and I can't be an RA because I've done all the years I can do. I, what am I going to do? And they looked at me and they're like, you didn't take your math class already. Well, why did you wait so long? We could have helped you, but I passed it. Luckily, I passed it. But like, oh, good. Math wasn't my thing. And the same, like, I remember taking the regions and having friends like tutor me over and hours and hours. Because I could like get by, I could squeak by in the class, but the regents was like, I can't take a math regents. I'm gonna like, no, like if somebody- You gotta get, school, you gotta like, get that, you gotta get there early and, and, and get a good seat, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I remember like being stressed, like I still remember the stress of it. And for what? Like, it doesn't make, like for so many people, they're not test takers. And I'm an okay test taker. I'm not a great test taker, but I'm an okay test taker. But it's like, just, the pressure that comes behind these tests where it's like, if you fail this test, you fail the class. It doesn't matter if you've been doing okay. Maybe you haven't been doing great, or maybe you've been doing great, but you're still gonna fail the test. And that means all your work and all your effort and everything you've done doesn't count anymore. And there's this clip, I don't know, I'm sure you've seen it. It's um, from Good Times where the younger son talks about the bias in standardized testing. He's like, my friends can't get the answer because it's asking something like, I'm going to paraphrase it, and I remember what the analogy was, but I remember what he compared it to. He was like, something to something is as cup is to saucer. And he's like, I know what it is, but my friends don't have saucers. So they don't know that a cup goes on a saucer. They don't get what a saucer is, so they can't make the connection because mm. they don't know what it is. And that's what is still happening to this day. It happens to city kids in the sense that they say something X number of kilometers or miles away, where if you live in the city, you know distance by my, by blocks. You don't know distance by miles. You don't know that something is 1.2 miles. You know that's 20 blocks away. You know that's 25 blocks away. You know that that's two train stations away. You know that's five bus stops away. That but, standard train station distance. <laughs> you know, but it's little things like that. When you are coming from a suburb, you might not understand what a great, like what the George Washington Bridge looks like. Like my, my cousin's daughter does speech stuff with kids. And one day she was practicing my daughter showing these pictures of cards. And one of them was like, like a real, like a bridge with lights on it and stuff. My daughter said, and then there was something else. And she was like, it's funny because she did it with my other cousin's kids who are country kids. Like they're out in the suburbs. They don't even see highways basically. And she was like, they couldn't get it because they didn't have a reference point for it. So for mm. them, it wasn't they didn't recognize the word or they didn't know the word, but they couldn't identify it because they didn't have a reference point for it. And that's kind of the reverse of what usually happens, I feel like, on the testing. But it's just that kind of thing. If a child or a person isn't familiar with something, then you can't expect them to know it. You know, it's that whole, if you judge a fish by what a giraffe does, the fish isn't going to be able to equate. Like, they're both smart in their own ways. So when you look at these standardized tests, and yes, we need something that across the board tells us comprehension and ability, but how does that work if we basically speak two different languages? If, we, if we're looking from two completely different lenses? I don't, and you know, I don't think it's about changing it so that every test is so different where it's like, okay, mine says block, yours says miles, the next one says kilometers, this one says districts, but it's about realizing that maybe then we don't ask that question. Maybe then we frame that question with something that's actually universal. And it's, it's looking at things like that. But that doesn't happen until parents get involved. Because mm. the unions aren't going to care about that. The admins aren't going to care about that. The politicians aren't going to care about that. Who has to care about that is the parent of the child who's going to fail 
and get left behind because they don't know what a kilometer is to a mile and they don't know what a mile is to a block or vice versa, you know? And that's, that's the reality that none of us can exist in a public education system without the other one. And there's not enough of all of us sitting at the table. There's not enough teachers sitting at the table for this discussion. There's not enough parents sitting at the table. There's no students sitting at the table. There's not enough of the higher ups because you know what? To some degree, we need the politicians and the admins at the table because they're the ones that keep the machine moving. We are the machine, but they keep it running. We do need the funding, you know, and I, I, I sound anti-establishment a lot of the time and to some degree, yes. I, but mm. I do believe we need it. We need somebody to right. do the work we don't want to do. We need somebody to write the grants. I hate writing grants. That's not my forte. I am the action. Put me on the front line. I'll come up with a curriculum. I'll come up with an activity. I'll talk to a kid. But don't make me write the report about it. Like, I don't want to do this. So we need those people that want to do that, that that's their purpose, that they're good at sitting and talking to all the different people. But we all need to work together. We need somebody to protect the teachers. We need somebody to protect the students. We need somebody to protect the parents. Because the reality of it is, some of our students have to protect their parents. Some of our students advocate for their parents because their parents don't speak the right language so they don't get the accommodations and the respect they deserve from the schools. Some of our parents, you know, don't have the education so the teachers and the admin in the schools look down on them. Some of our parents, I mean, I have, I have, there's one parent in my school that always says, listen, I will do whatever I can for the school, but I can't be here because of my work hours. You need, you need food for the meeting? I'll drop off a car load when I drop my kid off in the morning. You need copies printed? Email it to me. I'll send it in their book bag. But I can't, I can't be here in person. You know, all these things that we're doing now, these Zoom calls for chancellor meetings and parent association meetings, why have we not offered these in the past? Why does it take a pandemic for us to meet parents where they are? You know, parents need this. There's plenty of parents that can take a 10 minute break on lunch and have a Zoom meeting with a teacher. But they can't show up at 3.30 on a Tuesday and meet with a teacher to talk about their child for five minutes or 15 minutes because the teacher has 59 other parents that they have to talk to, so they can't give more than 15 minutes. You know, so I'm supposed to take a day off of work to come and speak to you for 15 minutes about my child. And if I don't show up, then you say, I don't care about my child. You know, and that's not fair to the parent. But now we can come up with Zoom meetings and every meeting I've sent in the question, they don't <clears throat> respond to it. But I've asked if it's safe enough to send our kids back to school, why are we having these meetings virtually? Why are we not having these meetings across the boroughs in person like they do for every other info meeting they have for the rest of the time? Because I've showed up at those meetings where it's me and maybe 30 other parents sitting in an auditorium to find out about the latest and the greatest plan for the DOE. Why are we not having those in purpose? in person right now, but you want teachers to show up and deal with 90 students for the day and jump to the next class and do PDs and all this stuff. You want our kids to get on packed trains and packed buses and come into the school for the day and maybe wear a mask or maybe not wear a mask and use hand sanitizer because teachers, you don't want them to touch the faucets in the rooms and teachers on the contract don't have to turn a faucet on for the kids and all this other stuff that sounds crazy. like. I seriously have somebody said that that's why they're going to, and it wasn't an official on the record comment, but I was having a conversation with an educator. I know I said, I don't get why everybody's talking about hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. We know that it's more effective to wash your hands with soap and water. So great, you use hand sanitizer on the quick, but then kids wash their hands when they come into the classroom. And they said, but they'd have to touch the faucet. So let's just turn on the faucet. They're like, but they don't have to. What do you mean? That's <laughs> like, what I'm talking about. Not not being like, um, not coming to the conversation to like really have a conversation all the time. And so, so, oh, we'll, we'll see where this conversation goes. I mean, I can sit here and let you rant all day. I'm sorry. But, um, I, told you I can talk forever. This, uh, is, this is my passion. This is, I mean, this is I my know. And I this appreciate it. I love, <laughs> I'm all about the rants. I was just like, yes, fire emoji all yes. day <laughs> um but um is there like one last thing that you want to leave the people with the parents with the power I mean, just, with let's you have the power don't give the power away don't be afraid of using the power don't be passive this is not the time to be passive 
We have to take control of our child's education. And if you don't know what that means, if you don't know what that looks like, reach out. You know, there's so many of us that are willing to help, whether it's a homeschool consultation. Most of the homeschool people are offering free consultations right now. And it doesn't mean you have to homeschool. It could just be like, listen, I don't know what this means. You know, what does it mean? So reach out. If you don't, if you don't have a clue or an idea where to start with, what to do, reach out. I'm on social media everywhere as at just a BX mom. I will answer questions. I will, it doesn't matter if you're not in New York, I will help find you somebody in your hometown that knows what's going on there, or I will Google and figure it out myself and try to relay it to you. But reach out. There's too much, you know, we're we're at that instant information point of technology. We have everything we want at our fingertips. I have a Google and an Alexa throughout my house. Like we can't go in a room without being able to ask a question without having to type it. We have phones, we have series, like they're, they're everywhere. Use what you have because you have enough. And that's the other thing, you have enough. A lot of times we're left thinking that we don't have enough. We think that we can't do something because we don't know enough. We don't have enough time, money, resources, wisdom, but we do. We have enough. Sometimes we just need somebody to tap us on the shoulder and be like, listen, this is how you have enough. You say you don't have it, but I seen it. I seen your post last week. I saw what you said. You have it. So reach out and trust yourself. You are your child's perfect parent. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for joining me, for having this conversation. And um, listen, I'm going to have to, we, we're going to get the, the kids together. Yes. Right? I don't want to have to get you on another Zoom to see that beautiful face. No. We're going to so. do this Zoom. We're going to do this Zoom. We're going to figure it out. Next couple of weeks. All right. I, thank you. I'm here anytime. You know I'm always ready to rant. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know that. So I'm going to be hitting you up for one of these rants again soon. I'm going to need to get my awesome. fill. Make sure you say hi to Grandpa and to just the BX girl for me. Uh, and thank them for giving me so much of your time. Night. All right, so that concludes this mini series on micro schools, pods, and parenting with my amazing guest, Melissa, just the BX mom. If you're not already, make sure you go and follow this lady on Instagram. She's there on Twitter, and she has a really awesome blog with tips for parents. But as a teacher, I just really find her perspective so helpful and insightful. And of course, you got to have your heartbeat in the community. So she is just one of those community connections that I am so grateful for. And I just look forward to our relationship, just building and flowering and continuing to share what we're doing together with you guys. So let me know, what was your favorite part of this conversation? What did you learn? Uh, you know, show love to Melissa in those comments down below. If you haven't already, I don't know what y'all waiting for. Hit that like button if you're new here. Welcome. We almost at that 100 subscribers. We might be at this point and we're going to celebrate if that's true. But hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell so you get notified every time I drop a video because we got a lot more coming your way because we are spreading this disruption all around the globe. And before we get out of here, I'm going to just ask you if you can a dollar or two, make a small donation towards my classroom and all the amazing stuff that I'm doing with my students in there. They, I mean, I don't know who they are yet this year, but it is bound to be an amazing group. You can check out all the work that I do with them on my Instagram at Making History with Miss Edmonds. Of course, follow the Class Disruption Instagram. It's also on Twitter. All the information is in the description down below. So hit those links check us out let's spread this disruption and until next time y'all know what i need you to do stay foolish out there